Uh, honestly, I would love to just dive right in and ask you, what are the major uh, toxins that we should be looking out for that we are most commonly exposed to? Okay, so this is a huge conversation, Evan, right? So I, w I always think it's easy to classify it into buckets. So there's the toxins that you get exposed to when you put things in your mouth, your food, your alcohol, your water. Are you drinking that water from single-use plastic water bottles? Are you eating food that's not organic? All the things you put into your body deliberately, that's one bucket. One bucket is all the stuff you put on your body, your hair product, your shampoo. Do you dye your hair? Do you use something on your face? Do you use makeup? Do you do something to, to take off hair? Uh, all the things that are, that are essentially touching your skin because your skin is your largest organ and it absorbs. And then that third bucket is all the other stuff. That is, do you drive a gasoline powered car? Do you, do you sit in any car? Because there's 10,000 chemicals in that, including flame retardants, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, formaldehyde. That's the stuff they preserve you with when you're dead. You, know, you don't need that when you're alive. It's things like flame retardants, it's things like gasoline fumes, uh, dry cleaning your clothes. If you put on makeup or nail polish, the, the chemicals in that, if you're sitting on the vegan chair like I am, vegan chairs are plastic. Plastic is endocrine disrupting. So there's three separate buckets that you get exposed to. And essentially, you want to start to take a step back and go, okay, well, what can I impact today? You can't impact all of it every day. What can you impact today? Right, right. Yeah, that's actually um, coming into this conversation. I was definitely mainly thinking about what we're eating and consuming, obviously. Uh, but being in a car, that's a really interesting topic. So, um, and something that makes a lot of sense now that you mention it, but it wasn't something that originally came to my mind. So I know ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> it really is right now. I'm going to sit in my car and have all of it going through my head. No, I recommend filtering in the air. Filter the air in your car. You can do it, actually. Not the air filter that they change out when you go to Jiffy Lube and they show you how black it is and you're like, oh my God. I mean, do change that out, but uh, you can get... The one we got for my husband and my daughter when we got cars, when we got new cars, was the IQ Air Atom, A-T-E-M. It's like 12 inches in diameter and it goes on the back of... I put it on the passenger side and it'll filter the air of all those toxic chemicals so you're not breathing it in. Wow, okay, got you. That, you said that was A-T-T-M? A-T-E-M, IQ Air, and, and my boyfriend, we call him my boyfriend because he sends me everything I want. I have a you know subscription and it arrives prime shipping. So we joke like, oh, just buy it from your boyfriend. Um, as my kids and my husband will say, buy it from your boyfriend. So anyway, uh, you can get it off Amazon or you can go you know hunting for it, but it's not a cheap date, but when you think about what you're exposing yourself to and what you're going to have to get out of yourself and how much work you're going to have to do it. It's worth doing if you just bought a car or if you have a new car. Mm -hmm. And obviously with time, the toxicity level would be lower just due to like half-life and all that or? It off gases. Yeah. I mean, you think about when you get in the car, I would say somewhere between two and three years, it stops smelling like a new car. And so the, at that point, it's off gassed enough the challenge, Evan, is I would never buy a used car if I had a choice because a lot of people will sell their car after it gets flooded. And that's even worse, right? <laughs> then you get a whole load of mold exposure that you don't want. So I would say given the choice, I would go for a car that hasn't been pre-owned unless you can track the source of where it came from and you know it didn't get buried in a in three feet of water and now the car is moldy. Yeah. Would... Uh, would would opening the windows be an option for like off-gassing? Yep, definitely helpful. I mean, don't leave it open. You, you're you on the West Coast, I think, and I'm on the East Coast and it's wet. So you don't want to leave your car open if it's wet, but if it's dry, absolutely leave it open. Or put it in the garage and leave, keep the windows open so that you can just, at, at, anything you can do to let it off-gas is helpful. Okay, gotcha. And then in terms of food, which is obviously a huge one, um, I mean, Clearly, we are going to be in contact with, uh, you know, if unfortunately we're not able to eat purely organic food, you know, you're going to have pesticide usage, insecticide, all the all the not so good stuff. Um, but also, you know, we have 
uh, certain fish that does have heavy metals. Um, I believe sardines have even levels of arsenic in them, uh, rice as well. So uh, what are, <laughs> what would be the best foods to eat in, for, in terms of us staying away from the most toxic consuming or containing foods? Right. I mean, this is so challenging, right? You're not going to eat just air because you have to eat. Uh, what I would say is pick the big battles. So grains are universally contaminated with herbicides, particularly glyphosate, which is implicated in fatty liver. One in every four Americans has fatty liver. So we're, I'm just talking about it in America. So I would say pick big battles. If you're going to eat flesh from animals, make sure that it's grass-fed and organic so that you're not getting the chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, endocrine disrupting substances in your body. And then if you can't eat organic, or if you're not sure of the value, what I would say is use the environmental working group, EWG, Dirty Dozen, and Clean 15. Because ideally, you're going to want to get rid of the ones that are in the Dirty Dozen and eat those organic. And then the Clean 15 are the things that if budget is a concern or uh, you're not sure, these are things that if they're not organic, it's okay. Uh, so I, I would say pick your battles. I, I don't personally eat the high mercury fish ever. And I have to tell you my favorite food, my parents are from Michigan and we would go and visit and they have these amazing delis that have sable, that smoked sable. Growing up, I never knew what that, I just never knew what that was, right? But those are high mercury fish. All the big predatory fish that eat all the other fish, they can't detox it any easier than we can. And it sits in the fat like it sits in our fat. So when you eat the ahi tuna or the toro tuna and it's the nice fatty piece of fish, you're eating a big dose of, of mercury. So I personally stopped eating that. I would say, unfortunately, the amount that you get in any one serving is usually enough for like three months of exposure if you have typical detox. So one serving is good for three months, but most people will eat it every week. So you just get this massive body burden. So I stopped eating it because it's been such a challenge to get rid of mercury from my system. I don't want to add any more. Obviously, my choice isn't everyone's. But I would say don't eat it more than quarterly. Check it. See if it's impactful. And uh, try to rotate your diet around and get a big, broad variety of everything so that you're not pounding the same thing every day. Because that's where you get in a rut and then you end up getting exposed when you don't mean to because you're just eating the same thing every day. Try not to do that. Yeah. And so would our body, like, let's say, for example, if we're taking mercury, if we were to stop consuming like heavily, you know, containing mercury foods, uh, would our bodies just naturally detoxify that? Or is there work that we need to do, like, you know, sweating it out in a sauna or exercising to move the lymphatic system? Like what would be the, you know, it, would it move on on its own or would we need to put in work to get it out? It kind of moves. It, so this depends on how good of a detoxer you are. I stink at detoxing. So I'm on the, it's really not going anywhere part of the spectrum, but then some people are better detoxers and they will move it. You can put about 1% of your body burden or body stores of mercury into your gut every day. The challenge is that often because we don't have the proper mechanism to poop it out, we recycle like 99% of it. So you're really only getting rid of 1% of 1%, which is a tiny amount. So it'll take you a really long time, assuming no other exposure. But you, you're on the West Coast. When uh, What's really cool is the pine needle trees sequester, take mercury out of the environment. But the challenge is when they burn, they give it back. And so mercury lands on us, on the ground, in our crops. And so we do get exposed to mercury in a lot of different ways, not just from eating the high mercury fish, but uh, logging also has mercury. If you eat high fructose corn syrup, that uses mercury to take it from corn to syrup. And you're getting a big fat dose of glyphosate too. By the way, to stop me at any point, because I'm never the good news bear. I'm never like, oh, cool. Everything she says is so inspiring. No, it's horrifying. So stop me at any point if, if you've reached your limit of tips. But I would say avoid high fructose corn syrup. Uh, if there's a wildfire, avoid it like the plague. Don't hang out. You know, if you don't hang out in wildfires. Um, and uh, don't eat the high mercury fish. Yeah. It's, it, uh, 
you made, you made me laugh there when you said that you're the bearer of bad news because um, actually when I first started getting into health and wellness, so I dealt with a lot of uh, gut issues growing up, specifically like irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, my, funny enough, my Spanish teacher, he's the one who completely led me on this path. And uh, one of the first books he ever gave me, yeah, very random, um, but he gave me a book called, I think it's like The Hundred Year Lie. And it just, first chapter is just talking about a ton of environmental toxins, you know, the uh, different things that are in like our furniture and, and yeah, all of that. And so I remember for like two weeks, I ended up uh, just eating salads and uh, basically kind of like doing intermittent fasting without even knowing it. I just, I was like so freaked out. So um, yeah, it's, I think there's a, a balance here, right? Like we need to know this information um, and then find like a happy medium of where, you know, where we can take action and all. So uh, to that point, what would be the best ways to detox? And also, I've heard a lot about chlorophyll being a potential way of detoxifying our blood of heavy metals. Is there truth in that? Have you heard anything on it? Um, and then what are other methods that you personally use to detox? I think we need to back up a step because everybody, I, I will say detox is very sexy, right? Detox is a very sexy conversation about how do I get it out of me? Nobody wants it in them. However, if you are eating lots of packaged food, if you are a total stress ball, if you don't move your body regularly, if you pride yourself on getting five hours of sleep or less every night, if you spend hours in front of the screen playing video games, those are the foundational behaviors. If you don't poop, if you have toxic relationship with others, those are foundational things that will absolutely make it impossible to detoxify your body. So it's sexy and interesting and cool and fun to do detox, but you cannot run before you walk and you have to first deal with the foundations. So eat, sleep, poop, move, think, have good relationships. Basics, just literally basics. Now, assume you're doing all that. Now we can do the good stuff. Okay. So yes, there is a basis and benefit to uh, spirulina, chlorella, all of these algae-based uh, treatments, they, they do actually help pull out metals. Uh, they also help pull out mold. So those are great. Fiber, particularly the propylmannan fiber derived from the konjac fruit, konjac, konjac root, is extremely valuable for uh, helping to bind. It supports gut function. You know, think of it, if you're not pooping, you're not detoxifying. So you have, so fiber can help people be regular. And when you're regular, you move everything out that doesn't need to be in your body and it helps bind. So there's absolutely truth to that. The thing, I do a ton of different rando stuff. So, um, cause I don't forget I had metals. We didn't even talk about what are the toxins you can get? The heavy metals, the mycotoxins, which are the mold that puts, that uh, mold, sorry, mycotoxins are what mold strains put out when they're in your body. And then there's the other category of flame retardants, nail polish, endocrine disruptors, PFAS, that's that whole other category, everything else. So I personally do chlorella. I do that fiber I mentioned. I do pectisol, which I'm actually drinking in my water. I throw it in my water every day and I drink three cups of water in that format. Uh, I do collagen. So I get my protein. I eat grass-fed beef and I know there's a lot of ways people can eat, so I'm not here to argue with people. But what I will say is if you eat flesh from animals, it does give you what the liver needs to work properly in phase two. So before, so I guess we have to talk about what does that matter, right? So most toxins are fat soluble. And in order, once they get into your body, until you make them water soluble, you can't get rid of them. And if you can't get rid of them, when they're fat soluble, they go to your fat. So that's why men get man boobs. That's why women get and men get big bellies. It goes to your butt, your inner thighs, you know, the wings that wave when you do. You don't want those waving on the back of your arms. Like all that fat that we deposit is full of toxins. So the liver is responsible for taking your fat soluble toxin that you couldn't get rid of and actually making it in two steps. First into a free radical. That's phase one. And second, binding it and making it water soluble and, in, and inert. And then you pee, poop, or sweat it out. Okay. So if you don't have what you need, 
to make your meal, you can't cook. So the food is actually the ingredient for the liver to do its job. So protein helps the liver do its job. And if you don't eat protein, then you're going to need to get some type of phase two support. Uh, there are some medical grade foods that'll help support it, but it is harder to do detox if you're on the vegan spectrum because you're not getting what you need to, to do it. Let me pause there because that's like a lot to unpack and I kind of went back and forth and there's more that I do, but there's, there's also a lot to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, first off, I think something that would be important for the listeners to know is the importance of what you're mentioning here with the liver, right? The liver in detoxifying, it's literally detoxifies our blood, right? So um, would you mind kind of like breaking that down a little bit and also saying like what would be um, beneficial for our liver to be consuming? Like um, I've heard you mention as well, like glutathione, does that play a role with the liver as well? Yep. Okay. So let's talk about the liver. So uh, when you say talk a little more about it, do you want me to say more about what's happening in each step or what? Uh, where, where do you want me to go with that? Just so I make sure I answer your question. Let's keep it um, just pretty like surface level in terms of what role is it playing in, in the detoxification process? Sorry. Okay. If your liver is not working properly, you will dive. It can help you thrive or dive. There's only two options. So if it's working properly, you're going to thrive. You won't be depositing fat where you don't want it. You won't have man boobs. You won't have a big belly. You will be pooping regularly. Uh, just as a little aside, I call this the holy triad. So your adrenals, which are these little glands in the, right above your kidneys, they are part of your endocrine system and they give you energy to move, but they also respond to threats. You know, the fight, flight, or freeze, that's your adrenals. Then there's your liver, which is responsible for detoxifying, but it also gives you sugar stores if your blood sugar is low. And it stores vitamins A, D, E, and K hanging out in case you need it. And then there's your gut. So those three organs work in this beautiful symphony and any one of them can throw any of the other ones off. So back to your liver. Your liver is presented with this fat soluble toxin. It could be even a hormone because hormones are also fat soluble. Your liver is responsible for dealing with it. And in phase one, five different things happen. Largely it relies on B vitamins, B12 and folate are critical here, but it also relies on things like glutathione, like you mentioned. And glutathione is made from N acetylcysteine and alpha lipoic acid, magnesium. So you can use the substrates to make the cake, or you can just take the glutathione. Either way is fine. After phase one, that 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 toxic thing actually is more toxic. So it becomes a free radical. And then in phase two, you use the B vitamins, the whole range of B vitamins, magnesium, glutathione, and acetylcysteine. You you use all of these items to convert it, then bind it make it water soluble, make it inert. And once it's water soluble, it can either go into your urine, your poop, or your sweat. Those are your three key. Your breath is also a detox mechanism, but it's not the major one. Major is poop, pee, or sweat. Big ones. And it can't go in there if it's, if it's not water soluble because it's like oil and water. You can't mix them. Yeah, no, that's beautifully put. And yeah, speaks largely to the importance of the liver. I knew it was important, but that was a great uh, course for me as well, honestly. And in terms of foods that are good for the liver. Wait, Evan, bef before we can go past that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think this is a really good point to just drive home that your liver is going to deal with the most pressing issue first. So if you get a massive toxic exposure, you're not going to deal with your hormones because that's, that's like a lesser evil. And whenever you drink alcohol, alcohol is the most toxic issue that your liver gets presented with. So when you drink alcohol, all the things that it was doing stop. You don't do any of the detox processes except deal with alcohol when you're dealing with when you're dealing with alcohol. Meaning alcohol, clear and present danger, stops the presses. All you deal with is alcohol and you don't deal with those other, you know, hundred thousand chemicals that you just got dumped with from I don't know, touring a power plant or getting a new car or whatever it is, right? You, you don't deal with any of that if you're dealing with alcohol. And it's important to remember because people think like, oh, it's just a couple of drinks. But it's really, really nasty for your detox, especially if you're a high-performing athlete or you're someone who is trying to sculpt your body. You can't get rid of your hormones properly and then they build up where you don't want them. Same thing, different day, right? So I'm sorry for interrupting you, but it's, it's really important to talk about that. It's not popular at all. 
pause me at any time, Wendy. This is honestly, this is your show today. Um, so no, and that was such a key point because like what you're essentially saying is when you do even consume, like let's just say one beverage of alcohol, that's essentially like kind of halting your normal detoxification and then now focusing on detoxifying you from this alcohol that is present. Um, that's huge. Yeah, and I would argue that we're so toxic and getting exposed to so many things every day. We literally can't afford to pause, stop the presses. We cannot afford it because we're getting deluged. Yes, no, that and that's so important. And, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, in terms of what's good for the liver, in terms of food, uh, I've heard of this theory that like supports like. Do you know if there's any truth in that in terms of eating liver for liver health? Um, is there any benefit in that? Yes, and it sounds so creepy, right? And I have to say, I love chopped liver, and I ate it on my birthday. Um, we made duck, and duck always comes with the stuff inside. And my mother-in-law was like, oh, I'll make chopped liver. I'm like, okay. And it was delicious. So, uh, yes, like supports like. And to me, it's always counterintuitive that eating the organ that filters the body is good for filtering the body, but it really is. And I, I don't know why, but it really is. You're right. So eating organ meats... Don't eat the brain. There's some concerns around um, uh, prions and, and things that cause dementia. Don't eat the brain. But yeah, eating, eating, it, eating organ meats is very supportive for detox. And in fact, a friend of ours has come up with uh, seasonings that are based in organ, dehydrated organ meats, and then seasonings are layered on top. And it's like your taco package, your taco seasoning package, except it's medicinal organ meats with flavor that you use to flavor things. It's pretty cool. It's called pluck. Pluck. Okay. No, I I knew there was a there was a reason I liked you, Wendy. The second you said duck, I was like, okay. And then also, chopped liver on your birthday. No, you're you're in the club already. Um, yeah. No, I I also um I love to actually buy liver and chop it up and add it into like my ground beef. I find that's a pretty good way of of uh, masking the flavor. Um, I, I'll admit I didn't grow up really eating a ton of liver and it is something I've had to like develop that flavor for. So uh, that's been a great way to do it. Liver and onions, man. We will make liver and onions. We bought a cow. Okay, we're the weird ones. I have four kids. And do you know how much food four children eat? Like they like to eat every day. So we bought a cow and we got the organ meat with the cow. And the trick to liver is not overcooking it. Honestly, when it becomes that big rubbery thing, it's so unappealing. So you just sort of, it should be rare. Otherwise, it is really unappealing. Uh, rare to medium rare, uh, don't cook it well done or you're going to be very unhappy. But we make it with liver and onions and salt and that's it. And it's and my kids eat it, which is shocking. Wow. No, that's that's awesome. And and yes, you're you're preaching to the choir here. I'm a, I'm a pretty big person myself. And I mean, I shot up like a weed growing up. So um, yeah, I <laughs> I definitely put a dent on the income of my parents <laughs> and just food. Um, for sure. But so yeah, sh uh, shout out to you for, for getting a cow for the family. That's amazing. Now, one thing I love to focus on this show as well, and, uh, I would, I would love for you to speak on in terms of detoxification is, um, you know, pooping is obviously a massive way in which we detox, but I know there's a lot of people obviously with just gastrointestinal issues like all around, but, uh, constipation seems to be a massive issue and it also seems to be a massive issue uh, specifically with a lot of the women I come in contact with, um, you know, and, and I know, or at least I've heard that that can also be an issue for um, like uh, recycling estrogen that's trying to leave the body. Um, so what can people do for constipation and, and what role is that play? Like, are we recycling also all those toxins that aren't exiting our body essentially? Yeah. Okay. L let's drill into this. I mean, I see patients clinically and I'll say, do you, are you, you can't say to someone, are you constipated? Because most people say no. So what I say now is, do you poop every day? And if so, is it a nice poop, a nice pipe, or is it bunny poops or something in between? You have to really <laughs> drill into it. So, so the standard is at least one really nice poop every day, if not every time you eat. It's called the, I remember learning about this in med school and being like, by, 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 the time, by the time I learned this in med school, I was already way down the celiac path. I just didn't know it. And so when I learned this, I was like, who does that? It's called the oroanal reflex. When you eat, you're supposed to poop. Babies do it. You know, we joke about, you know, you feed the baby and then they poop. That's normal. So it is normal to poop every day. It's abnormal not to poop every day. 
And if you poop after every meal, that's amazing. We always joke, you know, my son disappears halfway through dinner. We're like, where'd he go? Oh, he's on the toilet. Then he comes back and he finishes his meal. Oro anal reflex. So anyway, constipation. Yes, you. Uh, if you don't poop every day in a nice long pipe, what happens is you're technically constipated. There's an enzyme in your gut called the beta-glucuronidase enzyme. I don't know why they call it that. It's a terrible name. It's all throughout your body too, but in the gut, it's particularly nasty because when you put these, remember the hormones and the toxins are bound. They're bound to a methyl group that comes usually from the B vitamins. That's why if you're going to take a B vitamin, it's important to take a methylated B so it's ready for your body to use for detox because like 40% of us are not good methylators. And so if so odds are pretty good if you're taking a B, you need it to be active and ready to go. So anyway, there's the methyl group and there's your toxin and they're bound. I think of them like a barbell. So hormone, toxin, whatever you want to call it, it's bound. There's your barbell. The beta-glucuronidase enzyme, when this is in the gut, comes by and cleaves the two. I wish I had more hands for this part of the demo. So here's the two that beta-glucuronidase cleaves. Now you have this water-soluble binder. This is just a methyl group. But then you have that back to a free radical no longer bound, no longer water-soluble, no longer inert. It leaves your gut. It goes back in your bloodstream. Your liver's like, didn't I deal with you already? Well, I can't deal with you right now because I'm dealing with alcohol. It's Friday. <laughs> I'm dealing with alcohol. So you put it in the fat to store. And remember, it's in its highly activated free radical form. It, is a, a, it creates angry fat. Angry fat is inflammatory. Inflammation leads to difficulty with late weight loss, hormonal challenges, brain dysfunction, you, know, you name it, it leads to everything. Inflammation is the root of all of it, and toxins cause inflammation. So uh, yes, if you are constipated, it is really nasty for you because this whole downstream effect of, of cleaving the toxins from their binder, recycling them, and then having to deal with them a second time, where they go back into your constipated gut, and you start the cycle all over again. But wait, you already got deluged with all the toxins that y y your body... You know, it's not like you don't get toxins just because you're dealing with your old toxins. You're still getting all of these deluge toxins. It's like Lucy and Ethel when they're trying to wrap the candy and the candy just keeps coming. It's like that. You know, these toxins just keep coming and we're trying to deal with one toxin. But again, there's this whole conveyor belt of things we're getting and it makes us sick, fat sick and feel like we're dead. Jeez. Yeah. Um <laughs> Not a pretty picture. So trying to be regular is important. Now, does that mean for someone who is isn't regular? Is it a hydration issue? Is it not enough fiber? Like what would be the major things? Like would taking like psyllium husk help with that? Right. I always look at, okay, what, what do you put in? You are what you eat. So what are you eating? If you're eating uh, 30 to 40% of the population has the gene that makes them likely to have celiac. Celiac is the autoimmune reaction to gluten. So you don't have to have the autoimmune disease to have a reaction to gluten. So if you're eating, if someone says to me, oh, yeah, I eat it, you know, what do you have for breakfast? Bagel. What do you have for lunch? Sandwich. What do you have for dinner? Pasta with chicken. Okay. Well, why don't we just start by taking out the processed food and the gluten and see if that makes a difference. It may not be the gluten. It might be the processing or it might be the gluten and it comes in processed form. So we have to get some data. So I recommend getting rid of sugar and uh, dairy and gluten, because those are the top foods that make people constipated. I recommend managing your stress. I recommend make sure you get enough liquid. I make sure you, you, I recommend you have movement. If you're not moving your body, it's hard to poop. So, so that's why a lot of athletes are like, oh my God, I go to the gym, I gotta poop. Right, you're moving the organs around. Silly, and then you say, okay, what are things that help you move your gut? So magnesium, when you put it in the gut, it'll pull water into the gut and make it contract. Okay, we like that. Psyllium husks, increasing fiber. So through psyllium husks or um, you can do, I'm blanking, flax, ground flax, chia seeds. These are all great ways to get fiber in. Uh, a lot of nuts have fiber and fat. And so things that will cause the gut to move. You can also do, if you're really stuck, like you're just backed up, I'm a huge fan of colon hydrotherapy because it retrains the colon how to actually contract. First off, it cleans it out and then it can contract. And it was like, oh yeah, I'm a muscle. I'm meant to contract. So you can retrain the gut 
to contract properly. But you essentially have to pull a lever that's out. What's, what is not right? And so we'll go through all of these different things. And there's tons of, st of things to take if you're constipated. But the goal is really to figure out, like, why are you constipated? Let's fix that. Right. And really quickly, in terms of magnesium, I know there's multiple forms of magnesium. And, like, I've heard magnesium 3 and 8 is great for, like, sleep. Is there a specific form of magnesium that's great for uh, digestion? Yeah. So ma mag 3 and 8 is great for brain health, uh, focus, word recall, difficulties, uh, memory loss. It's great for that. It does cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's wonderful for that. I'm a huge fan of magnesium citrate for constipation, part largely because it does get pulled into the gut and, and it causes the gut to contract. Sometimes it's a little strong for people, so you can either take less or you can dilute it with taurate or glycinate, which aren't as focused on the gut, but can help. So you can either take it alone or take a blend. It just depends. You might have to tinker with it because your reaction isn't someone else's reaction. So go based on what you need, not what kind of the bottle says. And people say to me, can I take extra? I'm like, yeah. Really, the only downside to magnesium, it'll relax you. So maybe you don't want to be relaxed. And then it'll give you diarrhea if you take too much. And so people who are constipated, they're like, I would love that. I'm like, I know. So that's really the only down. If you get diarrhea when you take it, you should take less. I mean, you know you've taken too much if you have diarrhea. We're like, all right, take less. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's excellent advice. And yeah, I know um, too much magnesium can be, <laughs> it can be like, definitely overdone and you could spend a day on the toilet, but like you said, might not be the worst thing for some people. Um, and also in terms of stress, I really love that you brought that up. Uh, stress is something that I've been like heavily focused on for the last year and, um, you know, ways of management, but you know, obviously when we're in a stress state, when we're in that sympathetic state, we're not in a rest and digest state. So when you're stressed, you're essentially yeah, you're not digesting your food, hence that could also be um, a reason for the constipation or just kind of upset stomach, correct? Yeah, I mean, think about it. So let's even back up. If you eat food and you don't chew it well, and by the way, my kids are always like, oh, mama's chewing her food. I'm the last one standing at the dinner table. It takes me the longest to eat because like two years ago, I committed to chewing my food because think about it, digestion starts in your mouth. And when it gets to your stomach, you then act on it with stomach acid and you start the process of conversion for your calcium, magnesium, folate, B12, and iron. So if you, A, don't chew your food properly or B, don't have enough stomach acid, by the time it gets to your gut, you have not started to extract from it what you need or even started the process of conversion. So it's important to chew your food. It's important to slow down. It's important to take some deep breaths because like you said, when you're stressed, you don't digest. So take some deep breaths to signal the body, okay, it's time to, it's time to uh, quiet down here because stress can inhibit stomach acid. So that can make you constipated. And then stress will inhibit the pancreatic enzymes. That can make you constipated. Large pieces of food have to be broken down. That takes longer if what you give to your gut is this massive chunk. You know, most people chew two to four times. Chew, 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 swallow. You really need to be chewing like 15 to 25 times to break. The, it'll be like mush. You'll swallow it inadvertently because it's just mushy. That's when you want to swallow, not when it's still chunky. So you have to slow down. It will make you constipated. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's very simple. You're, you're sending like half chewed food down to your stomach, which is going to make it work so much harder. Um, and... Yeah, and also too, the benefit of chewing is so great for the development of the of the facial structures and and all the muscles within the face and the throat. The manly jawline, right? You get the good you get the good jaw. Yeah, I mean, haven't you seen the uh, the like silicone balls that you can like chew on essentially to develop the uh, jaw strength? Now, I, another question in terms of detoxing, uh, we talk about you know trying to not put more bad in, like trying to stop at that you know first level of intake so something that i'm a pretty big fan of and i've i feel like i found a, a great balance with it is uh is doing occasional fasts here and there and you know when you're not fasting you're obviously not putting anything bad in but is your body detoxifying at that moment in time because obviously you're probably not going to the restroom as much you're still obviously peeing you could sweat if you're moving and stuff but 
is would you classify fasting as a form of a detox or do you find any benefit in there? Yes. And I, I, I mean, you have to, you can't fast indefinitely. You have to break it. So I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. I'm a huge fan of resting the gut. I'm a huge fan of cleanses, but let's be clear, they're cleanses. It's not really a detox. It's more like a reset. And if you're going to do that, I'm a huge fan of doing it in sync with the earth. So if I live on the East Coast. It's cold. This is not the time to do a juice fast. The earth is cold. It, this is the time if you're going to do a fast, do a bone broth fast and add some collagen to it and rest the gut. The... Um, best time to do a juice fast would be late spring into the summer as as the earth is warm it's 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 in sync with the earth essentially but again it's not necessarily a detox it's a reset it often will reset your relationship to food quiet down the cravings have you get focused on oh yeah i can do this right i did a five day fast a, a number of years ago and it was fascinating because or i should say it was fascinating so what i learned was I got really hungry. We we had this like fiber drink for five days. One, I got really sick of peppermint. That was the flavor in the fiber juice, A. Uh, B, I hate juice, so I flatly refused to drink apple juice with it. So I just drank it in water. It was just not that tasty. But what was really cool, and I still take with me to this day, is that I got really hungry. But I never, I always thought that when you got really hungry, it would keep escalating. And you would continue getting hungrier and hungrier. And that didn't happen. I got really hungry and then it passed. And then I would get hungry again and I would get really hungry and it would pass. But it gave me the insight to understand that it's actually going to pass. I'll be okay here. Right? So um, very interesting. So I'm a huge fan of them, but not for detox per se right? Because it's more of a, rejuvenatory, a rejuvenation behavior and, a, and, a, and a, it's kind to rest the gut, but it's again, not detoxing you, it's resetting. Yeah, gotcha. No, and that, that makes absolute sense. I know a lot of people ask me about the health benefits of fasting, which of course there are health benefits to it, but the greatest benefits that I always find every time I do a fast is the mental portion of it where you just, you have a greater appreciation for food, you, you know, take time with it. And yeah. And also you learn the, that your body is very resilient, which is uh, a neat thing to experience, you know, um, which we don't usually experience in today's world. And then uh, I also wanted to ask what would, what would be a great way? Because obviously if we want to know what toxins we have and really where we're at, the best way is to test it. I mean, that's with anything. If you, if you want to know how deficient you are in vitamin D or whatever it may be, like you, you have to test. So uh, what would be, like, do you have a test that you use or one that you would say would be the best one? And, and how would we go about that? Yeah. So if you're going to test, you're going to need to work with a senior functional medicine provider who can actually do the testing. So, I mean, I didn't do this testing for the first, I would say, eight years of my practice. I just was not comfortable. Now, I'm a late bloomer. So a lot of providers don't take eight years to get there. But I took, let's think about this. Yeah, it took me about eight years to get into it. And then I got into it because it was personal, right? I had all these issues, so I tested myself. So I'm a huge fan of test, don't guess. So for the metals, I like the urine test. Now, it's not the holy grail, meaning when you get your result and you go, oh, you know, we use a cutoff of eight. Oh, the level is 17. It doesn't tell you you have exactly 17, you know, parts per whatever, parts per million, whatever the the measurement is, it tells you that you have a moderate body burden. If your level's super high, it tells you you have a high body burden or you're getting an exposure. So it's not the holy grail. And we, but we do test to understand, is it low, medium, or high? Do we need to intervene? And I use the urine testing from uh, doctor's data. And we do a baseline test to make sure that you're not being exposed in some weird way that we've missed. And then we do a provoked test. You can do it on the same day. Usually, if I only see adults, so I will test using, as long as your normal weight, I will use 1,500 milligrams of DMSA. And if, if you happen to be, you know, 400 pounds, I'd probably increase that, but there's a pretty wide range that I'll use that dosing for, and it's provoked. Now, you can, you can test using your hair, and I'm not a fan of it, and here's why. 
The hair shows what you're voluntarily getting rid of, but it doesn't show what you actually store in your body. It's not telling your body burden. It's, to, it's similar to the unprovoked baseline test. It just shows you whether you're getting rid of something voluntarily. And because these are stored, these are, these are not things in your bloodstream. These metals are stored in your bones, your organs, your fat, your brain. You have to pull them out in order to see them. So that's the metals. The mycotoxins, we use mosaic, and it's a urine test. It's all urine. It's a urine test. And then the other category is either mosaic, which is my favorite one, or also U.S. Biotech. Both are urine tests. We just use them depending. Some Mosaic had some challenges getting the reagent, and so they stopped running the test for a while. So then we switched to U.S. Biotech, but I would prefer that test over anything because it's just such cool data. And that tells you flame retardants and phthalates and, and nail polish and gasoline fumes and uh, styrenes. It tells you everything. It's a really cool test. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, the average person, I'm, I'm guessing, has a pretty high level of most of these uh, toxins, would you say? Yeah. It's shocking, actually. Here's the thing, Evan. Like, I'm always surprised when I get someone in their 20s who has heavy metals because there's no lead in the gasoline. There's no mercury in the fillings any longer. But they get it. And you get it because your mom gives you 50% of what she had. And your mom was probably born before 1978. Or your grandmother was born before 1978. Why is 1978? Uh, pertinent. It's because in 1978, they stopped allowing lead into the paint. So any construction of homes after 1978 don't have lead in it. If you live in an old home that has not been gut renovated, you get a lead exposure. As the house settles, it turns to dust. You breathe it, you eat it, you touch it, you absorb it. So uh, I, I see a surprisingly high amount of mercury and lead in people who I, I just had a 32-year-old who had Nasty, aggressive breast cancer. I mean, that should not be something that comes out of my mouth, right? A 32-year-old with nasty, recurrent, aggressive breast cancer. But she had one of the highest lead levels I've seen in a while. And I was like, where'd you get that? She grew up in another country and it's not as regulated. So she had all of these toxins in her. And I was like, well, toxins are super inflammatory. And when you over overdo what your body can handle, you're going to get symptoms. And for her, the symptom was breast cancer. So uh, it is present, it is interesting, and it, it definitely deserves testing. No question. Also, the uh, the mycotoxins like the back, uh, sorry, the mold uh, that's growing, I, I know that's a pretty common issue, especially if you live in a very humid area. Um, and it's really the best, uh, well, the best option obviously is having a house that's either gutted or renovated or new and doesn't have those. But with the second best thing, be an air filter, like a HEPA air filter or something along those lines? Yeah, very much so. It's interesting. Ha one in every two buildings has had water damage. So there's literally no way that you... And I have a friend who lives in Arizona, and every time it rains, which is not that often, but every time it rains, her house floods. I was like, that's not okay. Like, that is not okay. So one out of every two buildings has had water damage. So it's literally impossible for you to grow up without being exposed to mycotoxins. Because think of it, the schools, schools are notoriously moldy. Dorms are notoriously moldy. So you go to college, maybe you went to uh, boarding school or you lived in your house or maybe you moved, but then you go to work. You work somewhere. I go to work out at the Y and the ceiling leaks. One in every two buildings has had water damage. So it's pretty, pretty prevalent for people. So a high quality air filter is really, it's, it's important to get rid of the source, right? So if you look up and you're like, oh, the ceiling's got mold on it, you should remediate that, you know? You don't want to live in that. But once you've remediated it, yes, get a high quality air filter. And when you do the construction, don't use paint with VOCs, volatile organic compounds. These are endocrine disrupting. These are cancer promoting. You don't want to use them. You want to do clean construction that doesn't, basically, you know it's clean if you open it and there's no smell. If you open it, you're like, oh man, I bought the I bought the purple bed and I had to put it in another room to off gas. And then I was like, I'm not sleeping on that. This is years ago before I even got into the toxins game. And I thought to myself, I'm not, I'm not sleeping on a bed that needs to off gas because even if I can't smell it, it's still off gassing. So we just got rid of the bed. Uh, we called them and we were like, no, not happening. So if it smells, it's off gassing. Don't use it. 
Yeah, no, and that's that's an excellent way to look at that as well. Um, I would have never put those two and two together, but that makes sense. Yeah, paint paint can have a pretty uh, strong smell, um, especially if you've been in a room that's not well ventilated and you've been painting it. Um, you you will know that for sure. Yeah, terrible idea. Don't do that. Yeah, whenever we do construction, no. We say to the contractors, we don't want you to expose to it and we don't want to live with it when it's done. So paint is the most commonly common use thing that I would say, do not get no VOC paint if you are painting because it off gases for months. You don't need that in your body. Yeah. Um, well, I would love to kind of uh, finish off this conversation on a little bit of a, a more empowering note, I guess. I would love to leave our listeners with maybe a little protocol, maybe something that you do in terms of like just, you know, ways in which we can help detoxify our bodies on the daily, uh, if possible, as well as maybe like what foods to avoid and what foods would be uh, something you would recommend in terms of like having low toxicity, uh, maybe even detoxifying. Okay. Let's start with food because you are what you eat and you do it every day. So it's, it's a low hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned. I would avoid to the best of your ability, avoid food from a package. If, it, if you have to read the label, right there it indicates it's already been processed. It has things in it that you probably don't want to eat. I would avoid artificial colors, artificial flavors. I would avoid alcohol. We've talked about it. It's just a clear and present danger for detox. So I would avoid that to the best of your ability and sugar. Those are the things not to do. And then the things to do. Eat the rainbow. Like Deanna Minnick says, eat the rainbow. And the, I really think the RDA people screwed it up because they say eat five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Well, guess what? People stop listening after fruits and they go, oh, I've eaten, I've eaten my five servings of fruits. And I'm like, you know what? You really need to be eating like two servings of fruits because two servings of fruits will get you even, oh, even that will get you over the RDA for sugar, which is 40 grams. Uh, so two pieces of fruit or less and five or seven pieces of vegetables. So go for vegetables, the green leafy, the cruciferous, the brassica family, because these directly support detox. Hands down every day, eat something in the brassica family. No question. All right, that's food. And then what else do I do? I do Epsom salt soaks. Some people don't have a bathtub. Put your feet in the sink. Turn it on hot and put the, put the Epsom salt in. It'll do it. You can do dry brushing. It's great because a dry brush is like, I don't know, three bucks. Get a dry brush, 10 bucks. It's cheap. And what it does is it opens up the pores. I do the dry brushing and then I go in the sauna so that I can get a good sweat on. But you can get a good sweat on just by exercising. So go move your body. Make sure you get enough sleep every day. Most people need eight hours in bed at least in order to get seven hours of sleep. I personally need like nine hours in bed to get eight and change. But we're all chronically underslept. And then did I miss any component of your question? Because there was a lot packed in there. So we talked about food and behaviors. I think it's important to remember that if you have toxic people in your life, get rid of them because they'll shut down. Remember, they'll make you stressed. Stress will shut down detox. The liver doesn't care where the stress came from. You won't detox if you, every time you walk in your house, your roommate is stressing you out. Not good. Get rid of them. I mean, don't off them, but just stop living with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know as well, I've heard you mention, um, and this is maybe a little bit less accessible to people, but uh, like a sauna as well would be a great method, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of sunlight and sauna, which I consider to be best in class. But there's another brand that I've seen them at a whole bunch of conferences and I've really drilled into it with them. It's called Therasage. They don't use PVCs in their portable sauna. And it's a fraction of the cost for the sunlight compared to the sunlight. And it's not installed and it's portable and you can break it down and it doesn't off gas. So that's a much more affordable option. But then there's a lot of gyms that'll have a sauna. So I would, if you're going to belong to a gym, I would try to belong to a gym that has either a steam or a sauna and go in that. Use it. That and then, uh, and then moving, right? Like getting movement in um, because once again, our lymphatic system doesn't really have a way to move itself. We have to move our bodies to move it, correct? Mm-hmm. You have to move it. So definitely move your body. Get a good sweat on and move your body to the best of your ability. Do what you can do. Yeah. And like you were saying too, a lot of the times just moving our body will also help to move our digestive system, which is another great way of detoxing. So, okay, cool. I No, I, I love those. And, and uh, 
uh, yeah, those are some awesome tips. But unfortunately, uh, we're getting towards the end of the episode here. I say unfortunately because this has been incredible for me. I was looking forward to this episode for a really long time. Uh, so thank you so much, Wendy, for coming on. I'm going to give you this opportunity to share any last minute tips or anything with the, uh, the listeners, as well as please provide all of the incredible work that you do uh, from your podcast to the book that you've written to just all of the incredible work. So uh, please take the floor and share all of it. Okay. Thank you. I think the most important thing to remember is that Rome wasn't built in a day and you will not detox in a day. And so it can feel sort of daunting or intimidating. Just pick one thing that's the lowest hanging fruit so you can have a win. And then once you have a win, have another win and have another win. So don't, the, the only way you lose this game is by not playing it. So be in the game. That's my tip. And then uh, we have a bricks and mortar in two locations in Massachusetts. We literally just opened up this week. So we have two locations in Massachusetts. That's fivejourneys.com. That's for people who say, oh, I really need a functional medicine consult. That's an insurance-based practice with a membership. And then we have our online brand called drwendy.com. And that's for people who don't necessarily need to see the doctor, but also want to be in the game, want to be involved. We have classes, coaching, programs, supplements, testing. We do some limited testing there. So we have, we have opportunities there to participate. And then, yeah, we have our Feel Freaking Amazing podcast because our, our goal is that you feel freaking amazing and every decade gets better than the one before. So you're either on that path or you're not. And so in our podcast, we explore that. And then we have the book, which is called Dirty Girl, Ditch the Toxins, Look Great and Feel Freaking Amazing. That's where we got the name of the podcast from. And that is all about a roadmap for how do you go from A to Z in terms of cleaning up your life, your environment, your relationships. How do you level up so that you can live a life you love and feel amazing doing it? Love it. Yeah. You have incredible work. I'm excited to uh, get your book and dive into that personally. Um, your podcast is awesome. I've, I've listened to a few episodes already. Uh, you have on some great guests and just excellent knowledge. So um, truly, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have had you on this show, Wendy. And yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing with the listeners. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. All right, everybody, you know the motto of the show, it's do everything with good intentions, connect to your elements. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.